So hey guys, we're back for another podcast, and I say it all the time that you guys are going to love this one. I think you guys are going to love this one, and uh, because I am, I've just I've been talking to Peter Brand today. We have Peter Brand on the on the radio, or actually on the phone, for all the way to Australia. So if you hear any snaps or crackles or pops or anything, that's just going to be with that connection. But we are on a digital a digital uh, line, so we're hoping everything's going to be great. And today we're going to be talking about Johnny Tyler, uh, Tombstone Gambler War. Uh, we're going to be breaking down a little bit about Johnny Tyler and talking about Johnny and uh, and breaking down some myths and in talking some truths about Johnny. And uh, and that's because of Peter Brand and his deep research and the way he researches, which if you heard my uh, my last three-part series with uh, with Peter – about Texas Jack Vermillion. It, he's, he's just amazing at it. And I love talking to him on the phone. I'm, I'm buttering Peter up right now. Um, of course, I want to, uh, thank the folks over at the Tombstone Epitaph. You can find them at www.tombstoneepitaph.com. And I urge you to subscribe. One year is 25 bucks. Two years, 45. Three years is $60. Now, the reason I tell people to do the 60 is that if you do three years at 25 as an individual subscription, you pay $15 more. So you might as well pay the 60 bucks, get it over with, save the money, and you'll get the Tombstone Epitaph right to your door. And the reason I love the Tombstone Epitaph is it is a newspaper and it's published and printed uh, by Arizona's longest running newspaper, the Epitaph, the Tombstone Epitaph, and you get Tombstone history and Wild West history right to your door. And who doesn't love that? So check them out at the Tombstone Epitaph at tombstoneepitaph.com. Uh, also a huge shout out to all my friends that, um, uh, I appreciate and I love over at the Wild West History Association. Uh, you can find out about them by going to wildwesthistory.org. That's wildwesthistory.org. And I urge you to join. It's 75 bucks for one year. Or you can do the three year at 175 and save some coin. The reason that the WWHA is so important to you is if you love history is four times a year they send a journal and the journal is 105 pages of solid history with true provenance, no commercials, no ads, no commercials, no ads, uh, nothing silly on there about makeup or cars or whatever you're going to get like you would with a magazine or a periodical. But this is a quarter inch thick. 105 plus pages long of true history and, uh, and it's a book. So, you know, it's, it's, it's 75 bucks a year, but you get this book that shows up at your door four times a year. So you're, it's technically, you're paying about 20 bucks for the book, which is the standard issue for a, a Western history book. It's delivered right to your door with some fantastic articles. So I urge you to join the, the Wild West History Association at, uh, wildwesthistory.org. So a while back, I met Peter, um, and we did the Texas Jack Vermilion series, and we've told Peter's story. And uh, if if I didn't if I uh, didn't admit that I value him quite a bit as a friend and as a story, I'd be lying because it's true. I just I value him immensely and his and his insight, and he's been very helpful in my podcast series. And I want to thank him for that. But one of the things that he did write is he wrote a book called uh, Johnny Tyler, A Tombstone Gambler's War. And uh, Johnny Tyler, it, most people remember him um, by the movie, correct, Peter? They remember him by the, the movie and Billy Bob Thornton in the movie Tombstone. Yeah, hi, Mike. Thanks for having me back. Um, yeah, I, I guess most people who love uh, the Tombstone story and have seen the the 1993 Tombstone movie would um, immediately know John Tyler from that uh, famous scene in the movie where Wyatt Earp slaps him in the face and, and says, you know, you're going to do anything but stand there and bleed, and, and then he throws Tyler out. And that and that scene is kind of one of the, the most dramatic scenes in the movie and has a couple of great lines where uh, I think Earp says, you know, he refers to a smoke wagon, which is slang for a gun. So a lot of people would know the name Johnny Tyler just from that movie. Uh, but I don't, I don't think they'd know a lot more or, or if any, uh, about anything else about him. Well, I, I think in the movie, 
It makes Johnny Tyler, and after reading his book, and if you're interested in his book, I urge you to go to tombstonevendetta.com. That's www.tombstonevendetta.com, and you can pick up the book by Peter Brandt, along with anything else that he has written uh, is also going to be on that spot. But like you said about... You know, Billy Bob Thornton, if I remember correctly, and, and for those that love the movie, you know, he, he slaps him in the face and says, you're going to stand there and bleed. After reading the book about Johnny Tyler, I, my gut tells me that if Wyatt Earp would have slapped him in the face and said, are you just going to stand there and bleed? Uh, Wyatt Earp would have got his ass kicked, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and one of the, um, one of the key things that prompted me to write the book was that there, there'd been a, a lot of misinformation and the movie tended to, um, I, I guess, generate that misinformation about gambling at the time and how, how someone at, at a gambling table would react if they were treated that way. And, and I wanted to dig deeper into what it was like to actually be a professional gambler in that era because uh, the Earps were professional gamblers a lot of the time. Doc Holliday certainly was a professional gambler, and there was there were untold there were several of of them at the time. And the sole job in life was being a professional gambler. Now that piqued my interest because I I wondered what it would be like to have your future decided on the turn of a card. Um, you could win it all or lose it all, and that that kind of um, that, that that high stakes lifestyle um fascinated me so i wanted to i wanted to dig a bit deeper but the last time we spoke um was about the vermilion um, book that i wrote and to be honest that vermilion book took so long to uh, come to fruition and so long to investigate that i needed a break after that book so um in 2013 and 2014 i actually took a step back from research and writing and i actually instead of spending my my time traveling to the US on holidays, I actually took some personal time away and I, I traveled in the South Pacific and I, I went to some islands, I went to New Zealand, I, I went to Canada and I, I did some just normal holiday stuff just to recharge and refresh. And I took time away from it because I'd, I'd been mentally exhausted by writing that Vermillion book. That might sound odd to some people because there are some authors that are just so prolific that they just pump out articles and books one after the other, but I'm just not like that. I, I try to uh, investigate people who haven't been investigated before, haven't had their story told before. So I'm, I'm starting from scratch. I'm starting from a blank page, whereas a lot of other people are, are writing about people who have already had their stories told and they might be adding to those stories. So I needed some time away and I, I took those two years off. And as it happened, in 2015, there was a new biography um, written uh, by a couple of authors on Luke Short, and he was another professional gambler of the year. And I bought that book and I read it and I and they they didn't spend a lot of time on Luke Short in Tombstone. And um, he was a professional gambler who arrived in Tombstone, and he was uh, he knew the Earps, and um, he certainly would have run into Johnny Tyler in Tombstone. But they didn't spend a lot of time in that biography on um, on the on Tombstone and the gambling situation there, and that that kind of disappointed me slightly. And I thought I might I want to investigate that a bit more. Why were the, why were so many gamblers um, coming to Tombstone, what was it like um, in Tombstone with all those gamblers all wanting to win? Because um, let's face it, we're all gambling to win if we gamble. Um, and what was it like to lose? Uh, what was it? How did this, the whole process run? How did you open a Faro table? Um, who owned the Faro tables? So I wanted to dig deeper into the lifestyle of gamblers, and and that led me um, to do a bit of. Uh, research on that whole topic and that's how I got started um, exploring Tyler. It was by actually by Luke Short so I can thank those biographers for getting me kick started on that but what what really piqued my interest was that Short um, was not only obviously a, a gambler but 
he was a noted um, quick quick on the draw gunfighter who actually killed a, a man named Charlie Storms in uh, in Tombstone in February of 1881, and they covered that in their book, but they didn't really go into a great deal of detail about why that happened. They they assumed that it was just a a disagreement between two gamblers, between Storms and Short, and that, you know, one thing led to another and Short was quicker on the draw and kill Storms. But when I dug deeper and I read more about Tombstone itself, I realised that there was actually a, a gambler's war or confrontation going on in Tombstone and they were all vying for the dollar. They all wanted to win at the tables the saloons wanted to be the most popular saloon in Tombstone. So there was rivalry between saloons. There was rivalry between gamblers. And that led to a lot of tension. And, and that piqued my interest. And I decided to to investigate that a bit deeper and dig deeper. And that's how I got started on the, the Tyler uh, situation because he was a professional gambler who arrived in Tombstone um, at the height of the boom. So that's how that got started. But when you write a book and you, and there's a few others that we spoke about that don't focus on the mainstream players, like there's there's hundreds, I wouldn't even imagine, try to even count how many books there are about Wyatt Earp. Correct. There's not a lot of books, if any, other than yours, that is solely specific about Johnny Tyler or Texas Jack Vermillion or your booklet about Perry Mallon. Correct. Because so, your research yeah, so is that, hard and it takes a lot out of you because you have to go to those places and you're starting from scratch. Like the people that write White Earp, they've got hundreds of books to start from. When you, Peter, says, I'm going to run about Johnny Tyler, there's no place to start. Exactly. So, so my my motivation is never to rehash what someone else has written. So, I made that um, my goal when I first started. I, my goal was to bring something new to the table, something new into the book form or into an article that people hadn't read before. So. Given that that's my goal, I'm setting um, it, a, a hard standard for myself because it's not easy to find new stuff after all this time. There's a lot of people looking and there's a lot of people finding things and there's a lot of people publishing. There's major publishing houses publishing rehashed books on on ERP. I mean, like you said, there's in the last five years, there's probably been at least another half a dozen books by big publishers. But what they tend to do is just rehash what's been already been written and maybe rephrase it and put a different spin on it. But what I try to do is to actually dig deeper, find something, some primary source that will give you a new aspect on the story. It will tell you more about players that interacted with Earp and Holiday and therefore give you more information about Earp and Holiday indirectly through these peripheral characters. And, I, I, I mean, I've had a lot of hit and misses. I mean, I don't obviously. If I don't find something, I, I can't publish. So I'm not as prolific as as some of these other authors that you would have interviewed. But what I try to do is bring new information. So in 2015, um, when I'd read that Luke Short biography, I decided that that triggered something in me. I wanted to get more information about the gamblers and and the war that was going on in Tombstone for the Pharaoh dollar. So unfortunately for us Tombstone researchers, the, the Nugget, which was one of the major newspapers in Tombstone at the time, it um, copies of that of the Nugget for a, a really important period, the first half of 1881, are missing. So there's there's no place, uh, no library or research centre you can go to in America that will have copies of the nugget for that, say, let's say off the top of my head, the first six months of 1881. So that's a big chunk. So you, all you've got is the epitaph. And we know the epitaph and the nugget 
tried to cover different stories. They covered the same stories, but they had different slants on things. Mm-hmm. So that's a that's a big gap in in um, our primary research. So, but what what I found when I was researching was that other newspapers throughout the country picked up the story uh, from some of those from some of those nugget newspapers. So you might you might find in in a similar mining town, say Virginia City or or in Deadwood they would cover interesting stories from Tombstone because they were mining communities and there was a lot of people that um, moved between those mining camps. So if you could find – if you had time to go through some of those other newspapers, say the Deadwood newspaper, they would pick up some of those Nugget articles and reprint them word for word. And so I thought, I'm going to look in Deadwood. Um, because Storms, who had been killed by Luke Short, had spent a lot of time in Deadwood, but stood to reason in my mind that they would cover his death. And luckily for me, the the Deadwood pioneer had picked up the full transcript of Short's coronial inquest testimony into his killing of Charlie Storms. And that was something that no one had ever read before. The biographers of Luke Short, as I mentioned, had published their book. They didn't have that. So they didn't have Short's actual word-for-word testimony at the coroner's inquest of why and how he had to kill Charlie Storms. And that proved to be really, really important as it turned out. So what I did, um, obviously didn't have enough for a book at that stage, but I, I wanted to explore what that testimony told me about why Short had to kill Storms and why Storms came after Short uh, in order to kill him. And the more I read his testimony, uh, it was quite lengthy and he described it in great detail. It became obvious to me that Storms went there with the intent of killing someone at the Oriental and Luke Short happened to be the guy that was dealing at the time or is in a lookout chair and then started dealing at the time. And it was that that triggered um, uh, something in me that said, hey, there's, there was a gambler's war happening in Tombstone. There was violence at these pharaoh tables. There was vendettas. There was um, this, this guy, Charlie Storms, who had come to Tombstone with the intent of causing trouble and killing someone in the Oriental Saloon. So anyway, armed with all that information, I thought, I've got to get this out quick um, because it's brand new and I thought people might be interested in it. So what I did is I went to the WWHA, the the organisation that you mentioned at the start of the podcast, and I said to them, I want to write an article that goes digs a lot deeper into the killing of Charlie Storms by Luke Short. They agreed. It came out at about 10,000 words, which was – it's quite lengthy. Um, and they published it, and I got a great reception from that article. I was receiving unsolicited comments on all sorts of media formats telling me, wow, that, that article is something else. That article tells us a lot more than we knew before. It, it expands on what we didn't know and what we do know now. And so I thought, wow, that's great. And then I was lucky enough that that article, as a result, the WHA gave gave me their award in 2017 for the best article um, of the year for that article about the killing of storms. So I knew that I was onto something. I knew people were interested. I knew that I'd, again, brought something new to the table, and I was happy with that. Um, but that... Uh, the wheels were turning again, and I thought, wow, there's, there's got to be even more to this story. And that brought me to Johnny Tyler because um, what Storms and Tyler had in common was that they were both called slopers. Now, slopers were a slang term at the time for gamblers who came from west of the Pacific Slope. So they were basically men who'd grown up and gambled in during the gold rush period in California and the the 10 years after that, and then who had gambled in the Comstock up in Virginia City and then who had gambled in San Francisco. And they were a hard, 
hard bunch of men, but you did not survive in those environments that I just mentioned Mm -hmm. unless you were an extremely hard, skilled, sometimes vicious gambler gunman. Mm -hmm. So Storms and Tyler were both slopers and – There'd always been rumours of this war between in Tombstone, a gambler's war, between the Slopers and the Easterners. And as it turned out, obviously the Earps were Easterners. And Easterners were a slang term for people who hailed from east of the Pacific Slope. So they were all the guys like the Dodge City guys. You had Bat Masterson, you had Luke Short, you had all the Earp brothers, um, you had several other men they they were all from that area that where they gambled in Dodge City, they gambled in Kansas, they gambled in Deadwood. So you had all these men who'd been brought up in different environments, albeit mining environments, but different people. Uh, they were dealing with different people and they were different sorts of gamblers. And when they all con- descended on Tombstone, there was a clash. And that's what got me into writing about um, Tyler because he was very, very instrumental. He was the lead sloper. Uh, he was a very aggressive gambler. He was nothing like he was portrayed in the movie. And the more I dug in about Tyler, the more I found out about Tyler, the more um, offended I was by the way he was portrayed in the movie because this guy was nothing like um, the, the guy that, that was in the movie. In fact, he was the polar opposite to the guy in the movie. Uh, Billy Bob Thornton is slightly overweight in that um, in that movie. Uh, in later roles, you can see he's obviously trimmed down a great deal, but in the Tombstone movie, he's slightly overweight. He comes across as a bully. He comes across as somebody who's um, picking on little guys. Um, and the actual real Johnny Tyler was a slim man. He was... Um, immaculate in his dress he was had piercing dark eyes he had the big handlebar moustache similar to Earp he had a presence about him he carried a knife and a and a short barrel gun like most of them did he was extremely aggressive he was violent um and he had a presence as well so that kind of really piqued my interest because I I wanted to get to the bottom of who the real guy was I wanted to investigate the gambler's war that happened in Tombstone and the Storm's information kick-started that. And then the more I learned about Johnny Tyler, the more I found, wow, this guy's worth writing about. This guy deserves his own book. Uh, and that's how it turned out. I, I, I got started in on him and it all fed into the Earps. It fed into Tombstone perfectly, which was is obviously my original um, interest. So that's how that got started. But that that piece in the movie, at the very end, not the very end, but the end where he, you know, you know, put your shotgun down and right there, and you know, Doc Holliday's looking at him. Oh, you know, I forgot that you were there. But yeah, that it was all made up because that's not Completely. how Doc Holliday and and Johnny Tyler met at all. No, and and that's. Um the, the sub the subtitle of the Tyler book is actually the full title is Doc Holliday's Nemesis: The Story of Johnny Tyler and Tombstone's Gambler's War. And I wanted to hit those three names: the, the Doc Holliday, Johnny Tyler, and the Tombstone Gambler's War because Tyler and Holliday had an awful lot in common, and it was actually Doc Holliday who clashed first with Johnny Tyler in Tombstone as opposed to the movie, which shows Earp just tossing him out of Tombstone and and Doc Holliday just dismissing him as if he's, you know, a servant and, and, and as if a man who'd just had his face slapped would walk down the middle of the street with a shotgun and be told by somebody, oh, put the shotgun down and go away and, and, and he would do that. I mean, that's just, that's just fantasy when, when you real, when, when you, research the real men that they didn't react that way in fact the, the reactions were quite the opposite the violence that was perpetrated over over gambling tables is legendary in the old west there's so much violence that was born out of gambling because they were drinking and if you were losing and drinking at the same time obviously 
you didn't like that. So um, I found parts of the movie to be very entertaining. Uh, I thought there was a, it was a great script mm-hmm. to the movie, but I found a lot of scenes totally unbelievable to somebody who's researched the era, and Tyler certainly would not have reacted that way. So, so I, I, that's what prompted me to write the book, um, and I was hoping um, that there would be others who would be drawn to the character because he, he was a larger-than-life character himself. And the other thing that I point out to people is that he was um, actually 10 years older than Wyatt Earp. He was 11 or 12 years older than Doc Holliday. So he had a lot more experience than those guys at the gambling game and at um, being a gambler. So the movie just didn't ring true at all. And um, it's disappointing when when they take real life characters, but they don't portray them accurately in movies. I find that annoying. <laughs> I hope I'm not the only one. Well, you're you're not. And if you're uh, wondering, we are talking to Peter Brand. Uh, Peter Brand is the author of uh, of Doc Holliday's Nemesis, the story of Johnny Tyler, Tombstone Gambler's War. You can find this book along with all of his books at tombstonevendetta.com. That's www.tombstonevendetta.com. In the movie, and I, and I won't go on the movie too much longer, in fact, this will be the last. We won't even talk about the movie. But you wrote in there that Doc Holliday and Johnny met around October 10th, 1880 at the Oriental. And yes. that and that words were said between the two men. There was a threat of a shooting. And Doc ended up actually shooting Milt Joyce in the hand. Yeah, so this is this is a really important pivotal point in in the whole Tombstone story, really, in terms of Doc Holliday, Wyatt Earp, and their political aspirations as well. So, for, so, so Doc arrives about two months in uh, after Tyler had arrived in Tombstone. So Tyler arrives, by my calculations, in around about July, late July or middle July, eighteen eighty. So Tombstone's had a chance to develop. It's had a chance to grow from being a, a tent city to having established buildings and hotels and and lots of saloons, naturally, because when you get mining, you get miners, you get gambling. So the Oriental was quite a, uh, a, a well-established saloon uh, by the time Doc arrives. So Doc arrives around about September of... Yeah. 1880, so September he's arrived 20, a few months after. Yeah, Johnny September Pyle. 23rd is what you wrote. Yeah, so so Doc, um, so Tyler's already been in Tombstone and, and he knows which saloons are making money. He knows uh, as a professional gambler, uh, he knows the scene. He summed up the people that are running the show in Tombstone and Tyler realises that there aren't that many slopers in Tombstone. There's a lot of Easterners in Tombstone. There's not that many slopers. So Tyler realises that um, as a sloper, he's slightly um, outnumbered and he's on the outer. What Tyler wants is to be to have his own faro table. He wants to be at best running his own um, faro table or saloon uh, and he wants to be making the, the most money. Um, and he's very competitive. Like I said, he's, he's a very vicious kind of guy who will take on an enemy as opposed to the movie, he will confront and he will draw his pistol or his knife. And he'd done that countless times before. So in my book about him, I had to go back and and look into his past, obviously, to, to see what kind of a man he was. And the book's divided into nine chapters. And each chapter is dedicated to a place where he set up his business to run uh, either Pharaoh or play against the house. So the first chapter deals with his birth in Missouri. The second chapter deals with his living in uh, and being raised in the Gold Rush area in California. Mm-hmm. Um, the third chapter, he moves to San Francisco uh, and 
works and learns his trade in the Barbary Coast, which was a hell of a yes. place to be in San Francisco. Young, he then moves crazy. to one of the roughest towns in Nevada, one of the most violent towns he could ever live in was called Pioche in Nevada, which was full of Irish miners and full of violence. He then moves up to the Comstock uh, and lives in Virginia City um, and runs into a lot of trouble in Virginia City. He then returns to San Francisco, um, hoping that his fortunes will change a bit. Um, so, and they don't. He's, his uh, fairer house in San Francisco is busted by the police. He loses a thousand, over a thousand dollars in money and his, uh, Pharaoh Den has put out a business in San Francisco. So Tyler needs to find somewhere else to go and he, he decides on Tombstone. So he's had, he's had at least two decades to hone his skills to, to become one of the best Pharaoh dealers and players there that, that he could be, um, before he's even arrived in Tombstone. When he arrives in Tombstone, like I said, he sums up the play. Doc Holliday arrives a couple of days later, and uh, sorry, a couple of months later, mm-hmm. and it's not um, – if anyone who knows Doc Holliday or has read Doc Holliday's story knows that Holliday had a temper as well, and Holliday was a drinker, Ty was a drinker, and they – their first meeting, it appears, is at the Oriental, which is a very nice saloon, and they have a violent clash. So you can tell straight off that these guys don't like each other, and we don't know the actual reason. I, I in the book, I, I pre- presume um, that it's that Tyler's trying to create trouble in the Oriental, and his subsequent behaviour shows that that was probably the case. The Oriental was the major saloon in Tombstone. It was making a lot of money. It was the place to be. Tyler was there to try to break the bank. Holiday was probably trying to do the same thing, or he may actually have said something to Tyler at the table. We just don't know how it started, but it started and it blew up. And and they, they both had pistols. Um, they, In fact, one report says that Doc Holiday challenged Tyler to a pistol duel, which was a very southern thing to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but Milt Joyce, the owner of the Oriental at the time, intercedes and says, I don't want trouble in this saloon. I want you both to leave. Now, Tyler, having lit the fuse, does leave, um, which is a little bit surprising to me, but he, he may have achieved his purpose by by creating such a ruckus and such a fuss that the owner has to intercede and ask them both to leave. Tyler leaves. Holiday is far more reluctant to do so. He wants his gun from behind the bar. Joyce says, no, you're not having a gun. Doc leaves but comes back with his own gun, an, another gun that he's procured, comes in and, and confronts Milk Joyce in his own Oriental saloon and the fight, the gunfight actually ends up being between Milt Joyce and Doc Holliday, not Johnny Tyler and Doc Holliday. So this was a, this was a pattern of behavior that Tyler used to do. He'd, he'd create the trouble and then slightly take a step back and, and watch everything explode around him. And he, that was a very clever way to do things because he'd create the trouble, but then remove himself, um, from the, the danger, let's say and let Holiday and Joyce go at it. Now, that was a very, very bad thing for the Earps because that created trouble by association. Um, Doc Holiday ends up shooting Milk Joyce in the hand. Uh, We think he also shot uh, a bartender in the foot. Um, Milk Joyce is not anything like he's portrayed in the movie Tombstone. He's not just a simple bartender who puts up with rubbish. Milk Joyce, was a, Milk Joyce was an Irishman who had a hot temper himself. So he goes at Doc Holliday, bashes him senseless, um, and this, he's bashed Doc Holliday so badly that Holliday is thought to be shot. There's mm-hmm. so much blood covering Holliday's head and chest that bystanders think that Holliday's actually been shot in the head so you can only imagine how bad Holiday looked um, from a visual point of view. T- 
turned out that he'd, he'd had a bad gash that had sent blood cascading down his face and onto his shirt front. So he hadn't been shot, but Milt Joyce was not a pushover in any way. And anybody involved in gambling at the time was was not portrayed as they were in the movies. In the, in the Tombstone movie, it's Wyatt Earp who's portrayed as the sweat with all the swagger. I, I can tell you... From research, any gambler who, any professional gambler of that era had swagger. They had to, otherwise they wouldn't survive. Well, you mentioned about the movie, you know, Milt Joyce is portrayed in the movie as an old man, kind of a bumbling old man, but he's the bar. But in reality, he was a young man. We look at, yeah. we look at Marshall Fred White in the movie as an old man. Um, I think it's Harry. Carey Jr., is that right, Harry Carey, the player? That's him? correct, yeah. And he, in he reality, he was a young man. in his 70s or something. Yeah, he was a very young man in, in reality. But what you said is true about Doc and, and the whole portrayal, and, and he starts problem, but I'm going to take you in a different area now. An area he couldn't get away from, and you wrote about, was when um, uh, Johnny ran into Dave Nagley. And yeah, so, from Virginia City, they had a long past, and he still ends up finding him in Tombstone. Yeah, so um, another character that deserves a, a biography. Um, and yes. Maybe. Um, Get on it. Maybe John Bozenick can, can take no. this run on one day. Is Dave, Dave <laughs> Nagel. Dave Nagel was another Irishman who ends up actually, um, he, he was a sloper, he, but uh, he clashed with Tyler uh, five years earlier in Virginia City, and he almost shot Tyler to death when Tyler got into an argument with this Dave Nagel uh, in Virginia City. And Nagel, again, another very tough Irishman, wasn't about to take uh, any violence from Tyler. Tyler confronted him. Tyler actually challenged Dave Nagel uh, and said, you know, do you want to be the man to take me on? And much to his surprise, um, much to Tyler's surprise, Nagel did. Nagel pulled his gun and hit him, hit him hard and was about to pull the trigger, blow his head off. Uh, he warned him he would. He said, if you, if you pull that pistol, um, which, uh, Tyler had in his hand, he said, if you, if you make a motion to pull that pistol up any higher, I'm going to blow your head off. So Nagel then ends up like, most um, miners, miners and gunmen and gamblers do. He ends up in Tombstone as well. So you had all these people converging on Tombstone that had known each other previously, and that's another point that I, I make in the book. These gamblers did the circuit. So when a town played out in one area, when PH died off, when the when the silver ran dry, the gamblers just packed it up and went to the next boom town, and that that's a a scenario that played out all over the West. So you had these these same gamblers showing up in the same towns. And and we had Deadwood gamblers coming down into Tombstone. We had gamblers from, uh, as I mentioned, the Slopers came from um, the California Gold Rush. They came from Virginia City. Um, and they all converged on Tombstone because it was the next, next big boom silver town. So you had these guys... Uh, that had history already. Some people knew they had history, others didn't. Um, but they, a lot of them did. A lot of them knew each other from previous towns. Some of them, like Tyler, had had violent altercations with people prior to coming to Tombstone. Holiday, I don't think Holiday and Tyler had ever met before, so they may have been um, sizing each other up when that, when that fight broke out. But why I mentioned it was very bad for the Earps was that there was an election coming up soon after that for um, for Pima the County. position of sorry for the for, position of yes. chief of police uh, or the Tombstone City Marshal uh, because as we know Fred White gets killed so Virgil Earp wants to be um, the city marshal of Tombstone but Virgil Earp is a good friend of Doc Holliday's. And when people in Tombstone are picking up a newspaper and reading that Holiday's caused all this trouble, um, shot Milk Joyce, that politically, that was a very, very bad thing for to happen to the Earps at that time. The timing was terrible because Milk Joyce banned Doc Holiday from the Oriental and it and it helped 
um, sort of ruined Virgil Earp's chances of being elected because he was um, deemed to be a close associate of Doc Holliday's. And when you're electing your city marshal, you really don't want someone associated with someone who's Mm -hmm. been shooting the bartender, if you know what I mean. Well, you you wrote this in your book. And you wrote, at the end of 1880, there was a great change in Tombstone. You had Marshall White, Marshall Fred White shot and killed on October 28th by Curly Bill Brocious. Uh, Wyatt resigns his position as deputy sheriff. Virgil loses the election of Tombstone City Marshal. And Correct. Johnny Behan becomes Pima County deputy sheriff. All exactly. of this was going on at the yep. end of 1880. So, a yep. ton of stuff happening. There was so much happening, and the Gambler's War is happening at the same time. So you got Tyler causing trouble, which indirectly impacted the Earps. I I, um, I think it was one of the reasons that Virgil, you'd expect Virgil Earp to be elected as, uh, as the city marshal, because... Uh, his brother Wyatt had been a very good deputy of Pima County. Uh, he'd received a lot of good press for his for the great work he'd done. Virgil was already um, a deputy U.S. marshal for the Arizona Territory, um, and they were seen by most as being, you know, uh, law abiding at the time. Um, but I think their association with Holiday kind of killed off. Um, a lot of things. Wyatt misread the the situation. He thought um, he'd step down as um, the a Pima County deputy because he knew Cochise County was going to be formed in a short while. Um, and so politically, things went south for the Earps. But it was all it had its basis, in my opinion, in this gamblers' war. So um, Tyler Tyler was pivotal in indirectly influencing what actually happened politically, I think, for the Earps in that period, that, that period towards the end of 1880, the beginning of 1881. And and it's and I don't think it's a coincidence that the beginning of 1881, Johnny Bean is uh, appointed as the, the new um, county sheriff of the newly formed Coaches County. Um, and... That's when we see Charlie Storms make his appearance, another sloper, uh, with a friend of his, another uh, a gambler named Henry Lyons, nicknamed Dublin, because, again, he was from Ireland. So you had Storms and Lyons converge on the Oriental. They're slopers, and they go up against the Easterners at the Oriental, and it happens right around the same time as Coaches County's formed and Johnny Bean's appointed as the... Uh, the sheriff of the newly formed Coaches County, Wyatt Earp, is uh, not in any law enforcement position at that time, and Virgil's just lost the election. So there was there was so much going on, and a lot of books cover that other side of the story. My book focuses in on what was happening with the Gamblers' War at that time. And I do, obviously, I mention what, what else is going on, but my book is, if you want to know about gambling, if you want to know about what it was like to be a gambler at that time, how gambling um, impacted um, the economy of Tombstone. There's actually a quote that I mentioned in the book that um, I think it's the epitaph that actually stated, you could judge the economy of a town, of a mining town, by how well the faro tables were were attended, and that really says something to me. It was it, gambling was a huge part of the Tombstone story. Well, I did a podcast with Donna Harrell, and Donna Harrell, for those of you who don't know, she is part of the Cole Younger family. She's actually a descendant, but she did some research about the food in Tombstone during the period when faro tables were at their at their peak. There was tons of money flowing in yeah. and out of Tombstone. And the food was insane, like fresh lobster and fresh fruit and breads and meat and the, the best spices and cigars. I mean, it was crazy. So 
like you said, you judge it by the money at the Pharaoh table and by what's being brought. And remember, their tombstone, if you really look at it on a map, is in the middle of nowhere. And that means daily shipments are coming in. And and the rail line, I believe, stopped at Fairbank or possibly is right or is a contention. Um well there was a there was a, a line to contention at some point, but when obviously in the early stages, uh the most of the freight um that you're talking about From Benson food freight and everything went to Benson and right. then had to be um brought by wagon. And that's twenty five miles. But yeah, so Tombstone was was a happening place. There's no doubt about that. And and there was so much going on. There were so many people coming to see whether or not the silver would last, whether or not um, the town was worth investing in. And those people who came were used to that sort of fare in places like San Francisco, uh, Eastern investors, um, money money men obviously had to be catered for. So. So there was great food to be had. There were there were luxurious hotels. There there were luxurious gambling dens. It wasn't all dirt and dust, although the the poorer sections of town probably experienced that. But there was there was an element of of luxury about Tombstone, and and the Oriental was seen as one of the most luxurious saloons, and that's why the Slopers targeted that saloon. They wanted to. To make it uncomfortable for people to gamble there, they wanted they wanted violence there. They wanted people to go somewhere else to gamble, mm-hmm. and that's the idea that the Slopers had. So Charlie Storms, um, Johnny Tyler, uh, Dub Lines, they went there to cause trouble. They went there to try and have the place um, make it less popular, so they could set up their own faro tables elsewhere and take that money. It was like a turf war, you could say. A modern modern day equivalent would be drug dealers trying to deal in the same areas. You, you often hear of drug dealers being killed because they encroached on someone else's turf. It was the same thing happening in Tombstone. Slightly below the surface, the newspapers didn't like to advertise, didn't like to write about it because it put people off coming to Tombstone. But it was a very, very um, explosive situation there. And as we find with Luke Short, Storms comes off second best. Storms tried to kill Short. Short gunned him down in Allen Street, killed him. Um, then Wyatt Earp came along and kicked his partner, Henry Lyons, out of town, warned him off. And and so we find that the Easterners are getting on top. We find, we find them flexing their muscle and Tyler realises that it's not going to be an easy job to win this gambler's war. He he thinks, you know, I've, I've got to bide my time. I've got to wait now. So that's what, exactly what he does. And um, But he does have an effect because Milk Joyce actually closed the, the Oriental down for the entire month of March. So if you think about the, one of the most successful businesses in Tombstone being shut for an entire month um, after the killing of Charlie Storms, you realise that it, that the the Slopers did have some wins in that regard. Like they did create some problems for the Easterners, and they did create problems for Milk Joyce because they he actually was forced to shut the entire saloon down for one month. And you can imagine how much money he lost. Mm-hmm. So we're coming up almost on fifty minutes. Yep. Goes by fast every single time. So what I'll I'll throw in something really fast at the end. Um, the 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 Oriental um, is reopened in April, but all the Easterners are kicked out. Milk Joyce has had enough of the Easterners. He kicks them out of the Oriental, and luckily for the Easterners, the owner of the premises that Milk Joyce um, leased the Oriental space from were putting a second level on top of the. The Oriental. They were actually creating a second story, and Lou Rickabar, who was another Eastern gambler, money man, he decided, "Hey, I can cash in on the popularity of the Oriental, uh, the newly opened Oriental. If I've been kicked out as a gambler, I can get my own gambling rooms built on top of the Oriental." And that's exactly what he did. He took Wyatt Earp in as a partner. Um, and the Easterners were a force again. They opened up a brand new gambling room above the Oriental. So now they're in competition with 
Milk Joyce, who wasn't happy about it. And Tyler again tries to cause trouble in Rickabar's saloon, Rickabar's gambling rooms, and that's when we see Wyatt Earp step up and throw Tyler out of the, the brand-new gambling room that's been built above the Oriental, and that's roughly the scene that's shown in the movie. The movie obviously shows completely wrong um, facts, but that's the scene that's based on what actually happened. So we have Tyler coming back to cause more trouble for the Easterners, but this time um, he Tyler pulls a gun on uh, Lou Rickabar in his own gambling rooms, mind you, um, to try and intimidate the dealer, and that's when Wyatt Earp steps in and says, you can't do that here, and punches Tyler several times and throws him out of the saloon and warns him to leave Tombstone. And Tyler, being the smart man that he was, actually does leave Tombstone. Well, if you're interested, uh, this is called, we're talking about Doc Holliday's nemesis, Johnny Tyler, A Tombstone Gambler War, written by Peter Brandt. Uh, you can find all of his books, including this one, at tombstonevendetta.com. And um, just so you know, to throw this out as a teaser, we haven't even spoken about Johnny Tyler and Johnny Behind the Deuce, which, correct, is another story. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so many stories in Tombstone. But the one thing I will mention about um, Tyler uh, when he leaves Tombstone, he goes to Leadville, and as fate would have it, that's where Doc Holliday ends right. up as well, and they clash again. Un- unbelievably, like I said, well, believably to some extent, because gamblers, again, they migrated to the similar places. You find Tyler clashes yet again with Doc Holliday later after Tombstone in Leadville, and it's all on again, another gunfight. And, and Doc is trying to live a normal life in Leadville, and he can't. Yeah, so, exactly. Doc, Doc's looking for some peace and quiet. And who does he run into in Leadville? But Johnny okay. Tyler, and Tyler's on the prod again, and it results in more gunplay, more bloodshed, more violence. Um, it's just a fascinating thing. It had me hooked, and I, I'm hoping that other people will be interested in the story because both those guys, Tyler and Holiday, had a lot in common. Well, you can get the book again at tombstonevendetta.com. Um, I will do my best for you listening to uh, to beg Peter to come back and talk some more about Johnny Tyler because I think that the ending from Johnny Behind the Deuce all the way into Leadville is definitely worth exploring. The phenomenal thing about everything that we spoke of, and it is my favorite chapter in the book, and I read it, is Chapter 7. Chapter 7 is an insane chapter in this book that talks really all about Johnny Tyler and Tombstone. So you get the book, great artwork on the front, fantastic, beautiful artwork on the front. You can get it at tombstonevendetta.com and just check out. It, it, you're going to end up getting the book like I do and then rereading it several times because what happens if you get into history and you read and Johnny Tyler pops up, you're like, oh, I got to read some more. You go back to your library and you pull the Johnny Tyler book out and you thumb through and you find that chapter and you reread it again. It's it's that good. I want to thank my friends over at uh, the Tombstone Epitaph. Uh, subscribe. Uh, become a subscriber and they will deliver the new, the uh, tombstone epitaph right to your door. 60 bucks for three years or 25 for one year. Um, or if you want to do two years, it's 45. And, uh, Mark Boardman, my friend over at the epitaph does a phenomenal job. And Eric Wright, who's an uh, associate editor, they do a phenomenal job at putting together the tombstone epitaph and you get history delivered right to your door. Of course, my friends, and I'm a member as well of the Wild West History Association. Check them out at wildwesthistory.org. And uh, this July, this July, we will be in Rapid City for the uh, Roundup. It's been gone for two years because of COVID, and uh, they're going to have the uh, ra- the the uh, Roundup, the WWHA Roundup, in uh, Rapid City with tons of uh, trips over to Deadwood. So if you're interested in... Uh, a history event that specializes in Wild West history. Go on the wildwesthistory.org and find the, find the area that talks about the roundup and, uh, and go make your hotel reservations. I would love to see you. I'll be there having some fun and doing some stuff that uh, you may not expect and, um, and see you there at the, uh, the roundup in Rapid City. 
Um, of course, um, if you're listening on I may, the radio. I may be there too, Mike. Oh, you, oh my God. Done deal. I may be there. I may be there. I'm trying to make it happen. Okay. If I drop, if you, if you walk in and I drop to the ground and I, I, you know, I put rose petals at your feet so that you are walking on, <laughs> you know, listen, that's just because I love you. Um, but, uh, all seriousness, um, if you're listening on the radio through, uh, iTunes or Spotify, please leave a rating and review. Uh, it helps, uh, get out the podcast because I do these for free. I just love doing them. And, uh, and I love bringing some stories to you. You can also find these podcasts on YouTube. So if you're listening on YouTube, you can find uh, some more over on uh, the radio side on iTunes and Spotify and Stitcher and the iHeartRadio app. And if you're a YouTuber, you can find me at YouTube at Cochise County Travels. Um, as always, uh, work safe, be safe, be great humans, find a charity near you and, um, uh, donate a little money. I know that times are tough right now with inflation and fuel costs and all sorts of crazy stuff going on, but there's folks out there that are really needing some help and 50 bucks, man, oh man, 50 bucks goes a long way. Is there anything you want to add before we go? Yeah, I'd, I'd just... I uh, like to say I love talking about these topics with you. I love talking about Wild West history. I love talking about Tombstone. So if there's anybody out there that has any questions at all, I'm on Facebook. Friend me on Facebook. Shoot me questions. If you're unsure about buying this book and you want more detail or you're finding it hard, uh, get on that website. I'm open to any questions. I'm open to help anybody uh, who has any, even just questions, answers. I love talking about this stuff. I love promoting Wild West history. So anybody, reach out to me. Feel free. I'm happy to talk. And if you need to get a hold of me for any reason, you can do so through my blue collar email address at hvacreeferguy at gmail.com. I do air conditioning and refrigeration for a living. And so the letters H-V-A-C-R-E-F-E-R-G-U-Y at gmail.com. 